as a vibrant and electric district, the old town of Paris is home to the Jewish Quarter, fashion boutiques, contemporary art galleries, and a lively gay community. What was once a swampy marshland is today a haven of beautiful pre-revolution residential architecture. Known for its charming, narrow cobblestone streets, it's a treasure trove of small boutiques, niche museums, and Instagrammable cafes. Today, I'm taking you on a leisurely stroll around Le Marais, the marsh in French. We'll explore some of its highlights, including its rich tapestry of cultural diversity, head over to St. Peter's Church before taking a little dive into the history of Paris at the secret Paris History Museum. But first, I have a sweet surprise for you, tucked away in the heart of this enchanting old town. We're filming today from the oldest bakery in Paris. In business since 1730, this bakery used to be the bakery for Louis XV. Yes, it's that old. Today, I'm going to take you on a little relaxing stroll through the old town of Paris. The old town, also called Le Marais, or the Marsh in English, has everything to offer to lots of different people. Le Marais features communities that are very diverse, from the gay community to the Jewish community, you also have beautiful art galleries and very contemporary avant-garde fashion designer. So it's a bit of fun for everybody. So join me on a journey through Paris's history and let's have fun together. Storer was established in 1730 by Nicolas Storer, baker to Louis XV. The story goes that Louis XV's father-in-law one day complained that the cake he was eating was too dry. Nicolas Storer improvised by moistening it with wine, later substituting rum for a more flavorful twist. This is how the baba au rhum was invented, a staple of French pâtisserie today. If you're ever in Le Marais, I highly recommend you taste history at this wonderful establishment. Now that I have my bakeries, we're good to go. Don't forget to subscribe. Before we begin our stroll, do you know where Le Marais gets its swampy name from? In the prehistoric era, the Seine River had two arms instead of one. Over time, as the climate changed, this second arm disappeared, leaving behind a vast swamp covering up the entire area between the Seine and where its second arm used to be. In the 13th century, this marshland was drained and converted into arable land. And this is where Le Marais gets its swampy name from, the giant marshland it was built on. Let's start our stroll now from the Pompidou Museum. Opened in 1971, this is Europe's largest collection of modern and contemporary art in Europe. As you continue your walk, you will stumble upon the Museum of the Art and History of Judaism. The museum retraces the history of Judaism. Jews have lived in Le Marais since the Middle Ages. They were expelled from France by Charles VI, but came back 400 years later after the French Revolution. Today, Le Marais stands proud of its Jewish heritage. As you look around, you will notice the many Jewish bookshops, restaurants, and bakeries located in the area. The narrow cobblestone streets here are best explored on a Sunday morning when everyday Jewish life has resumed after the Shabbat. Next, you will stumble upon the National Archives Museum. Its architecture is typical of Louis XIV's reign. The National Archives are where French history records are kept, dating from the Merovingian period all the way through 1958. A selection of these remarkable records is displayed in the permanent museum section and updated every four months to protect the precious documents from light damage. Some of the most famous documents kept here are Louis XIV's testament, a diploma from Charlemagne, and the last letter of Marie Antoinette. Let's take a little coffee break before we continue. This very Instagrammable cafe is called La Favorite. Located across the street from St. Paul's Church, it's a great place to take some beautiful photos. However, be ready to pay good money for your latte. This place is more expensive than Starbucks. Now that I've had my coffee, I'm ready to keep going. In 1580, the Jesuits were given land by the king to build a church modeled on the Jesuit church in Rome. Unfortunately, 
Many of St. Paul's church rich furnishings were unfortunately lost during the revolution. But the church is still well worth visiting for its ornate decorations and sculptures. If you walk a bit further, you will arrive at Le Marais' absolute hidden gem, the Musée Carnavalet, retracing the history of Paris from the prehistoric times to today. The museum is housed in what was once two separate mansions. Let's go over some of the main highlights of the museum together. The Gaulish people of Parisi settled around the middle of the 3rd century BC on a small area of land which developed along the course of the Seine. Mentioned by Caesar, the capital Lutetia occupied a strategic position allowing the Gauls to control river trade which provided them with a great source of wealth. Following its conquest, the Gallo-Roman city began to expand on the left bank of the city. The museum displays some major artifacts of this time period in its exhibition. The history of Paris wouldn't be complete without talking about Genevieve, the patron saint of Paris. An important part of the museum is dedicated to her. In 451, encouraged by a young Christian named Genevieve, the Parisians fought off invaders from the east. This is how Genevieve became the patron saint of Paris. From this day onwards, religious ceremonies honoring her life punctuated the daily life of Parisians from the Middle Ages to the Revolution. The next part of the exhibition focuses on Paris's history from the Middle Ages to 1600. A safe haven and economic crossroads, the city continued to expand during this time period. With over 250,000 inhabitants in 1328, it was the most populated city in Europe. The left bank of the Seine was a residential district inhabited by clerics and noblemen, while craftsmen and the working class lived in the heavily populated right bank. The city's first university, the Sorbonne, which still exists today, was founded in 1257. In the Middle Ages, the university attracted between 3,000 and 4,000 students. At the time, the bridges on Ile de la Cité were the only crossing points from one bank of the Seine to the other. The island was home to the political and religious authorities. To the east lay the canonical district and to the west was the residence of the kings until Charles V. The island lost its medieval layout when Napoleon III developed an administrative district here. The second floor of the museum presents the history of Paris from the 16th century to the French Revolution. I won't go into too much detail about this as the collection is expensive. During this time period, the population of Paris increased to 500,000. One of the highlights is the Folies, country residences which are built on the outskirts of Paris by wealthy Parisians, whose decor is reproduced as part of the exhibition. Another major highlight is the homage to Madame de Sévigné, a very famous French historical figure whose letters to her daughter have become a major piece of French literature. Her lodgings are reproduced here in room 101 to 103. She played a key role in Parisian social life, surrounding herself with influential political figures. On the eve of the French Revolution, revolts against tax collectors increased. A famous author called Louis-Sébastien Mercier declared, one will not be surprised to learn that the city of Paris alone earns the King of France nearly a hundred million per year. This dreadful sum is renewed every year, so it is not without reason that the French monarch called the capital our good city of Paris. It is a hefty cash cow. This part of the exhibition features some true treasures, such as the King's speech to the Estates General in 1789, before the royal family was forced to flee Versailles. Another highlight is the original of the first Declaration of Human Rights. Several items of furniture and objects used by the royal family under the captivity in the Temple Tower are on display, recreating their prison room. The urban design of Paris as we know it today took shape in the 19th century. The scale of investments in major projects, the remodeling of the urban fabric, the construction of buildings and the development of iconic areas such as the Champs-Élysées brought about profound transformation of the capital. These changes 
first introduced by Napoleon, drastically improved the quality of life of the population of Paris. The myth of Paris as a spectacular city began to appear. The city began to attract talent from all over Europe. Writers, painters, musicians, and much more, leading the city to become the capital of Romanticism in the latter part of the 19th century. The last part of the museum is dedicated to the more recent history of Paris from the 20th century to today. I found this part of the museum less interesting, so I won't go into too much detail about it. To sum it up, if you're ever in Paris, I highly recommend you visit the Museum of Carnavalet, which is truly a hidden gem. The museum is much bigger than it seems, so make sure you plan at least half a day to explore it. Le Marais has a plethora of other sites to visit as well. Other highlights include the Picasso Museum, La Place des Vosges, the Museum of Nature, the Museum of Magic, and the House of Victor Hugo. There is so much to explore that I may have to do a second episode in the future about this area. One thing is for sure. If you're in Paris, you won't want to miss Paris's swamp. And that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this little stroll through history with me around the old town of Paris. If you are around Paris, definitely come and visit this old town. It's amazing. Such a beautiful history all around. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to like and share. Ring that notification bell to be notified of every time I post a video. And don't forget to subscribe. And in the meantime, I will see you in the next video. Thank you for watching.